I am Xiu He, uh, the moderator for the event. With us here today are director and cinematographer Aubrey Bernier-Clark, intersex activist and documentary subject Pigeon, as well as filmmaker, actor, and intersex advocate River Gario. Together, we'll be discussing their short films, A Normal Girl and Pony Boy. Audrey, Aubrey, Pigeon, and River, thank you all for being here and sharing your work with us. You're welcome. What's thank up? Thank you for having morning? us. So um, let's begin with the question of uh, what inspired or motivated you to work on this project. Uh, Aubrey, would you, would you like to take on this first? Uh, sure. Um, so basically I uh, worked on, I believe it was season two of Transparent and uh, Pigeon also made an appearance on that season. So we didn't actually get a chance to meet on set, but that was when I first became aware of Pigeon and their work. And I was really um, in, just inspired by all of their amazing activism and just their energy as a person. Um, and then separately from that, Pigeon met my uh, creative partner, Shauna Lipton, at a talk here in Portland, actually. And um, they had kind of gotten a dialogue going about possibly collaborating on a film project and then uh, Shauna brought me into the mix and we all met and it just seemed like a good vibe and we all wanted to work together on making something. So that's how it happened for us. That's lovely. Um, Pigeon, how, how did you decide to collaborate with Aubrey and work on this particular uh, documentary? Um, so Aubrey, hi everyone, my name is Pigeon. I use all the pronouns in the world. Um, this is my dog. I hope no one's allergic to dogs here today. Um, that's one of the good things about Zoom. We could bring our puppies everywhere, um, our animals. And I use all the pronouns and I'm in Chicago. Hello, hello, hello. And also please feel free to like clap in the chat and give snap because it makes me feel better. Like I can't hear you and see you. We can't hear you and see you, but it does resonate if you say a lot of cute stuff in the chat. Like it's so cute. Okay, um, I decided or how I came to work with Aubrey and Shauna, the director and the producer. Aubrey's here today, but um, Shauna, I think Shauna is here. I'm not sure. I saw Shauna for a second. Um, Shauna, are you, is Shauna here? She's here in spirit, or she is here. She's just not on video. She's oh, okay. a participant. So, hi, okay, hi, Shauna. Um, was basically that like, I live my life kind of in a way where I don't really plan and <laughs> they hit me up and they were like, hey, we wanna work with you on making a film. We'll do a lot of the legwork, are you down? And I was like, let's go, like that was it. So that was how I decided. Lovely. <laughs> um, River, how, how did you uh, embark on this uh, creative journey for Pony Boy? Um, oh, first of all, hi everyone, River pronouns they them uh currently in new jersey um i well actually the, the the whole thing started in new jersey i uh i think i did pony boy as it started as a theater piece actually that i was working on in my undergrad i went to nyu for acting school and i was developing this kind of experimental uh it was a lot darker and kind of like creepier, kind of like murder vibe. Um, but it had to do, uh, the piece had to do with a, a queer uh, sex worker that would work in the highways in New Jersey. And I guess that was in 2009 or 2010. And I guess the past 10 years, I've just been developing it over and over. So I when I went to grad school to uh, film school at NYU, I mean, at USC, um, in LA, I, I just kind of revisited it because I felt like my experience at USC was being taught by a lot of white, old, cis men, and I felt suffocated. Um, and so my last, th my last year there, I was just like, I just have to make something that's just completely like me, like all, all in. Um, and so it's just like, oh, I, I actually never made a film that explored this part of my identity of being intersex. 
Um, and it was through the film actually that I found out that the condition that I was born with was an interest variation actually through doing research and seeing Pigeon's video, uh, there was it, but your Buzzfeed video or yeah. Thank so you. that was the first time me thinking like, oh, I'm gonna make a movie about this part of my identity. Let me look up this part of my identity. I was like, wait, I'm intersex. And then I see Pigeon and I'm like, oh my God, there's other people like me. And then, hmm. then that's just kind of how it happened. I was just like, okay, I, I guess I have to do this now. Yeah, that kind of explain, I think that resonate with how Pony Boy kind of traverse between dreams, dreamscape and reality, I think kind of resonate with what you, you just said there. Uh, thank you. So um, let's talk about the titles. I think it's interesting to position a normal girl side by side with Pony Boy. Um, both films depict intersex non-binary individuals yet both titles appear to have dominant social categories of gender. So what is the intention behind such a decision uh, and how the title is related to some of larger issues the film raises? Uh, why don't we start with a normal girl? Peyton, did you come up with the title? Aubrey will have to remind me, but... Um... <laughs> You did come up with it. Did? Oh, yes, yeah, I did. Yeah, we struggled to find a good title and then you were like, I know what it is. Oh, I finally hit the Yeah, I was, yeah, we were struggling. Um, I love this question because we rarely get to talk about the title and someone on Twitter tried to drag me once for the title or drag the film. And I was like, get in my face. Like, come on, like, it's my story. I get to come up with the title. And, um, the reason I'm using that title, or we came up with that title is when I was a girl, when I was a growing up a girl, I would go to the doctor all the time. And the doctor would say, um, everything looks great. Everything looks normal. You're just a normal girl. No one could tell the difference between you and anyone else, like um, except a surgeon with a surgeon's eye. Like you look, everything looks normal. You're just a normal girl. And they just kept saying it to the point of, you kind of know you're not normal when someone keeps telling you you're normal. So the, the title is not meant to be like, I'm normal, I'm a normal girl, like that person who's trying to drag me on Twitter. It's a critique that there is no such thing. There is no normal, first of all. And um, I'm definitely not a normal girl. <laughs> and um, so it was kind of just a pun, not a pun, but like a, a play on this, message that was forced on me since I was a kid that you're normal everything's normal don't ask questions you're normal you're a normal girl everything's normal except you know xyz but those were actually you know so it was like that's how we came to the title and I think Aubrey could say more or Shauna but that's kind of what I would say and I think it's interesting about um Pony Boy because if I'm not wrong River isn't it spelled b-o-i Okay, so I was just kind of interested to hear your answer. Yeah, yeah. River, what's the story? It, it is so B O I, even though to this day there are some funky ways that people spell it. Even <laughs> though, like, <laughs> like there's it just is always misspelled. But yes, it's B O N P O N Y B O I. Uh, <laughs> the reason I named it Pony Boy first because it was a reference to. Um, I'm a Bruce Springsteen fan and he, because of Jersey and one of his, the big, the, his first big concert was at the Stone Pony, which was in, um, in Asbury Park and it takes place in the Jersey Shore. So I was like Stone Pony, Pony Boy. And then, but then it became kind of like a reference and aesthetic to like the outsiders, like Pony Boy, the character in, in the book or in the movie. Um, but then in the narrative, the reason the character was called Pony Boy was because uh, Pony Boy's dad would give Pony Boy little My Little Pony dolls um, every time they'd go to the doctor um, and, and he'd be like a good boy. So like it was almost like a reward every time he went to, to mm -hmm. get... Um, like mm -hmm. seen by by his doctors and I guess now I feel like the title has a lot to do with like 
there's this idea of like being a show pony as well, being like uh, something that other people can look towards for, I don't know, a sense of entertainment or being objectified. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and for me, there's a lot of being put on display when you're intersex and, and being kind of like, uh, there's like this kind of like, you know, freak show quality that it felt like to me when, you know, every time I'd go see doctors when I was younger, um, that it was like, yeah, it was like I was the show. And uh, yeah, so there's a bunch of different layers of why I called it Pony Boy, but originally it was like a New Jersey reference. Thank you. Why is it B-O-I, River? Oh, B-O-I is because it's, that's why I was like, it couldn't be normal boy. (laughs) He clearly isn't a boy, (laughs) like. (laughs) <laughs> boy <laughs> isn't there a mustang in the video in the film too yes yes and then there's Does the mustang as well yeah yeah okay. the whole thing and now and now it's also a reference to my dad who who had a cattle farm when he was younger and my family still does in el salvador um so there's kind of that like cowboy connection to through my my dad and his family mm. yeah Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, I think it's a it's a nice segue uh, into next question. I realize uh, both films kind of share this tension between intersex individuals negotiate their agency with established structural conditions. So in Normal Girl, we see this tension is played out. Um, on the micro scale of family on the one hand and the macro scale of medical institution on the other. In Pony Boy, this tension, however, um, operates in a more implicit and intimate fashion, which kind of points to how structure gets internalized and expressed uh, in personal desires and actions. Uh, so River, would you please continue this conversation and talk a little more about how this negotiation between social structure and intersex agency gets crystallized in the narrative of Pony Boy? Wow, big questions. <laughs> I'm on the moon. Take your time. I'm so glad wait. it's River. Go River. Wait, wait, say it one more time. Say it one more time. <laughs> how this negotiation between social structure and intersex agency gets expressed and crystallized in the narrative of Pony Boy? Um, I think a lot of that narrative I kind of created, it comes down to Pony Boy, why I chose my decision to make Pony Boy as a character a sex worker. Um, And for me, I felt like it was an allegory to not being in control or, you know, how traditionally we've we've seen sex workers though much is changing now of you know feeling like your body is is not yours and belonging to other people's and it becoming something that is transactional at the same token it becomes pony boy's only way for survival as well Mm. um because as a character he ran away from home because his parents wouldn't accept him for being who he was so it's like his parents didn't accept him for being intersex or or then for being non-binary and so it led him down this kind of cycle of, yeah becoming a sex worker and uh perpetually kind of being disembodied because <laughs> he was disembodied by the medical industry his parents etc um so f- how i kind of I guess the way he gains agency to me is, you know, realizing that by the end, you know, that the that the real redemption isn't isn't a process that's done with other people. It's kind of realizing that, you know, despite having like a rough past and despite his circumstances in the in the movie being, you know not great he could overcome that through through realizing his own worth and through realizing that you know accepting his intersexness 
Um, and that is uh, the, literally the vehicle uh, for him to move forward. And, you know, at the end, there's that moment where, you know, he gets the car. Um, and for me, that was just kind of like a magical realism, kind of poetic way of being like, you know, in the end, the action of finally taking agency and being in the driver's seat is the way to to move forward. And it is very beautifully shot. So beautifully shot. Um, so let's move into the aesthetics. Um, for a normal girl, um, whereas the film is about intersex genital mutilation and its impact, it does not portray violence directly. Uh, rather, the physical wound is often demonstrated through animation and the inflicted psychological trauma. It's often mediated by Pagan's personal archive of photographic portraits. So um, tell us about this decision in terms of how the documentary represents violence and trauma visually. Maybe Aubrey, we can start with you this time. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, so much of what we are talking about in the film does sort of hit on that juxtaposition of childhood and violence and trauma. And we, while we wanted this film to be visually evocative and resonant with the viewer, we did not want this film to be triggering to people who have been through those kinds of experiences or anyone else. So, you know, early on, we kind of experimented with using some archival medical footage and it just didn't feel like the right vibe. Um, and it, it wasn't it wasn't what we wanted. So we, we came across uh, Pamela Guest, who's this amazing woman of color um, animator. And she just brought a really great uh, aesthetic with her to the film and was able to sort of portray these ideas sensitively and uh, beautifully, I think, in a way that, that does resonate and get our point across without crossing over into that sort of trigger territory, hopefully. Um, let's move to Pony Boy. Um, most of the scenes take place in the nighttime and the way to illuminate characters and the city through which they move becomes such an important factor in telling the story. And I noticed there are many occasions uh, where only practical lightings are, are used. One of the most memorable example for me is the, the last scene, River, you also mentioned, where we see Pony Boy illuminated by the light of the dawn and then merge with the lamps at the beachfront. Um, tell us more about this creative decision behind this uh, visual strategy. Yeah, the lighting was definitely uh, key and, and developed together with um, my co-director, Sade Clacken-Joseph and our amazing photographer, uh, Maddie Leach. Um, I think what we were trying to establish was um, you know, someone who was really reaching for the light and could see the light, but was also like far away from the light. Um, this sense of like longing to be complete, to be whole, to have the life that they wanted, but also being really far away. And I think it also relates to my feelings of when I grew up in, um, in New Jersey just like being really close to New York City, but like also like a bridge and tunnel away from New York City. And there's this sense of when you grow up in a place like that, like a suburb or, you know, but I think New Jersey is very specific because it's like, you know, the biggest city, the, you know, quote unquote, best city in the world. Um, that like, <laughs> Pigeon might have something to say about that. <laughs> no, I love New York. I'm <laughs> Um that it's just like, oh, I could be there, but I'm not there. And I used, it just sucks to not be where the action is, where I could be accepted, where where I could be queer and free, I'm in. Um, so I think that's, I. a lot of the lighting also was me trying to mimic um, or capture that kind of like neon strip club, like, uh, highway off the road just like you know with a bunch of car dealerships that kind of vibe um yeah thank you uh <clears throat> sorry my next question is for page in the river um 
I'm very curious about what kind of institutional and social challenges you've been facing as both intersex activist and intersex filmmaker and media producer, and how have you worked through those challenges? Maybe Pigeon, you could take this one. Institutional, what was the other one? Institutional and social challenges. Oh, social challenges. Um, I'll say that like, putting yourself out there, making yourself vulnerable in any way is very dangerous in this current society. Um, and the social things that I deal with, you know, it's mostly YouTube comments. <laughs> and cause I have a YouTube channel and actually a lot of the footage in the film is from my, it's like splices of my YouTube videos. And like, people just comment some really horrible things like throwing up emojis and asking me really weird things and saying really messed up things that I don't think they would say to people that they viewed as um, human or equal to them. I think they, because I share my story and I'm vulnerable and I say what happened to me and I'm intersex and I'm open about that. I think they see me as less than them, less than normal. I'm not normal. So when you're not in that, when you're in that category of not normal, people tend to be really disgusting towards you or say really messed up things. On the flip side, I get a lot of positivity too. Um, but so on the social, I think that's it. And also the other thing is like, it ends up being weird because anyone can Google you. And then they ask, they like, for instance, my landlord Googled me like a few years ago. And all of a sudden he's like talking to me on text about weird things that like, I do not need to be talking to my landlord about. So I think when you are giving of yourself and your story in this way, everyone and their mother, including your landlord, feels like they have this intimate access to you. And actually I'm writing a book right now and my collaborator who wrote a book about his life back in the day, told me that a lot of people after they read your story are gonna feel like they know you on an intimate level. And I think that's very true. I feel that way sometimes with people that I follow on social media or I've seen a film of theirs. I feel like I might, like I know them and we have this connection. Um, but we don't. And I think it blurs boundaries. Like people go across boundaries that they might not because they feel like this intimate knowing of you. So, and then institutionally, uh, nothing really. Um, I've had nothing but good things with institutions actually, and except the hospital, but the hospital doesn't matter. Uh, and because the whole point was to irritate them enough to get them to change their ways. And if, as you see in the film, we are with a group of intersex people, the co-founder of Intersex Justice Project and I put together a protest. His name is Saifa. And that was one of many protests against the hospital that did surgery on me when I was a kid. And recently this summer, this past summer, that hospital finally after years of a campaign called End Intersex Surgery um, came out in public and made a statement thanks to external pressure from Intersex Justice Project that I and Saifa started and Linnell and also internal pressure from allies that we gained that worked on the inside who were mostly trans and intersex people and also LGBTQ and then also just straight allies. I don't even know if straight people still exist. Like, is that still a thing? I guess there was probably a few straight, but it was this beautiful coalition from outside and inside the institution of the hospital that the first time we showed up at a protest, they called the cops on us and they put an internal memo and called us crazy activists with viol extreme, we had an extreme position on the, the, on the topic of intersex surgery. We, they, were, they were contextualizing us as extremists and that, they told the staff in this private memo that was leaked to us that don't worry, we called the police, everything's under control. <laughs> 
And then we did more protests and more protests and we did other um, things of doing public education in Chicago, like going on the trains and educating people on the train about what happens at that specific hospital. And eventually with the campaign from outside and then the staff on the inside who all came to have our backs, um, that institution folded. And they're currently the first and only hospital in the US, well, first hospital in the US to make a public apology to intersex patients and to make somewhat of a commitment to doing things differently moving forward. So they've hired an intersex um, uh, person to, to help them change their ways and they're gonna host a symposium and stuff. But the, the important thing is, is they did a, they're doing a moratorium on the surgeries. So that's a really beautiful thing that like, that film, A Normal Girl, documented. Um, so institutionally, like I have really run into nothing um, other than the hospital does not like me. But there's a lot of people that do on the inside that are allies, but the, the people that make decisions around surgeries on intersex kids, those people don't like me because I don't like them and I made their life as uncomfortable as I could for a while. Um, and then the social stuff, I just have to deal with the regular stuff that trans and um, all trans and gender non-conforming, uh, especially people who are visually um, non-conforming, I think that's the word, um, have to deal with online. And um, and yeah, so that's that. That's, that's, those are the, I, I hope I answered those two questions, but that's kind of what I could say about those two things. Thank you for that question. Thank you, Pigeon, because um, after watching the documentary, even though it's you know short film format, um, it is very pedagogical welcoming and uh, it is a very policy oriented film. So I'm so glad um, the hospital medical institutions have changed their practice um, because of you and other uh, intersex act activists. And there is a, um, a bill which is mentioned at the end of the film that did not pass in California. Um, there was a resolution that did pass. It was non-binding, which means it didn't have like legal teeth to sink into nothing. Then they tried to make it a bill that did not pass. Um, and this Senator from California or um, Congressperson, River probably Senator. knows. Senator. Scott um, Weiner, right? Yeah. Well, I'm talking about the guy that flipped at the last minute because there was this um, person on the committee to hear it. I think he was a Democrat and he got a donation from the California Medical Association the weekend before the vote came. And he was going to vote against, like, against the surgeries in California. I think he was the chair of the hearing committee that would hear the bill. Um, and then he got a mysterious 50 plus thousand dollar donation from CMA. And then he decided I like intersex surgeries, let's keep them going. Um, so Interact, I think is working again with Scott Wiener and others in California to do a bill again, try again. And I think it just launched and I would love River, cause I think you're with Interact or maybe you were, or you still are. Um, if you could maybe update us at some point in this conversation, because I think everyone here is from California. So it'd be really great to let people know about that. Thank you. The work is ongoing. Thank yeah. you for sharing that. Um, River, uh, what is it like for you to work as an intersex actor and filmmaker? What are some institutional social challenges that you've been facing? Um, well, first I'd like to just to touch on what Pigeon was saying. Yeah, that, that Interact and Scott Wiener are reintroducing a bill. I believe they did so earlier last month and I'm not quite sure on the particulars of when it will be voted on I guess at the end of this year um but yeah it's something that I should educate myself on or I guess everyone here in California we should we should look at it's called I think it's called SB 201 um that's what it was I think but that's I don't what know what it was it yeah I don't know I forget what the new one's called well one to ten Aubrey you know it's I oh no that's the resolution it's the intersex bill in California. There's only one. So. Yes, everyone. After this, we all have homework to Google this 
and you know to call I'll our representative a chat where you can learn about it for intersource.org should should have good info um but but being an intersex actor uh, like what pigeon said you know i think intersex people are still seen as not normal and 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 though i think trans representation has really you know in the last five years has just you know really paved so much ground and there's so much more trans representation that now i feel like the gates are now open to you know the conversation of intersex people specifically in in media and narratives and film and tv mm -hmm. um but my experience is uh there is still you know resistance actually um in the hollywood landscape i think people can now really grasp transness in in media um but are still kind of like you know i've been up for my dog's about to start crying um my i've been up for like certain roles where it's like you know we want like a trans person and by that i mean i think they they want like a, a passing lead trans woman as opposed to like a non-binary intersex trans whatever i am um, and it, it's, you know, it's been really frustrating actually just kind of, you know, knowing that there's, there's interest, but that the consciousness still isn't there to completely embrace and accept an intersex person or a non-binary person for how they are, but for how they're perceiving audiences will understand. Because at this point with, you know, shows like Pose and, you know, we, there, they understand that there's a market for people who who will watch trans representation, but with intersex, it's like, it, I mean, I think it's a little bit of a conspiracy in that, you know, people still have a resistance to accepting non-binariness and people still have a resistance to kind of, not wanting to realize that the gender binary is a fallacy like they're just like and a lot of queer people too like it's like i don't know i don't, it's it's this weird thing that i can't fully explain but like there's just i think people want things to be neatly in boxes and intersex people can just kind of disrupt that completely and and for as far as the you know how that affects the television landscape i think now you know i realized that uh you know i've had meetings at many different like studios with a lot of different executives and people are interested in you know having the meeting and you know meeting me there but then when i'm like you know let me let's make this movie happen. They're like, oh, well, maybe if you show me something, like we want to see still what you do. That's, um, that's great. So let's, like, go let's ahead. Talk, let's talk about the project that you're currently developing. I think this is a segue of, uh, could you talk a little bit more about uh, Pony Boy? It, it, does it have a feature is a yeah. development yeah so i've i'm i've written the feature i wrote it last year and yeah since last year it's it's been in development uh with a production company and um and an actor has come on board to also produce and so it's like it's happening but like and all things considered, I should say it's happening pretty quickly as far as like, you know, people write movies and then it doesn't, it takes years to, to get it made. So in, in hindsight, it's actually happening at a, you know, decent pace, but there's just been also just a lot of, there's been a lot of people who said they really like it, but it's not for them. And to me, I mean, there could, that could be for many reasons, but I do also feel like you know, the intersex part is, it's a subconscious kind of thing where it's just like, uh, I don't know, it just sometimes feels like all, all the help to get intersex 
to get the intersex like our voices heard isn't being fully fully like supported in a way i don't know I, it could just be me feeling just tired <laughs> But, um, but so the feature is happening and it's a development pretty much based on um, on the short, it's like the same character, but the feature actually goes much deeper into Pony Boy's childhood and specifically Pony Boy's relationship with his father, um, who's, uh, who's an immigrant from El Salvador. And so it has kind of the layer of like, you know, what intersex meant being, you know, a first generation, from in a first generation family um, from El Salvador. Um, so it gets a little bit more autobiographical. And that was actually really hard to write just because, um, you know, realizing a lot of my process in my accepting my intersexness has been like, you know, forgiving my parents for just trying their best and being, you know, people that, came here from El Salvador undocumented and like literally my mom was born in like a dirt floor shack in like the side of the road. And so for me to be born in a hospital was like a big deal. Um, and, and you know, they just kind of listened to what the doctor said and just kind of like did it and did and thought they were making the best choices. Um, so the movie for me is really exploring those kind of like dynamics between you know me being Latinx and also intersex and also it has kind of like a crime drama element so it gets kind of like mafia sopranos world also um so it's just like a mix of like yeah a lot of a lot of different stuff that I'm really excited about I'm excited for you and we'll we will all stay tuned for the for the feature um Aubrey and Peyton do you also currently developing any project based on a normal girl? <laughs> yeah, we are. We are working on a feature documentary also that um, that will kind of expand on the story we're telling in a normal girl and also sort of delve into a little bit of the history of how these surgeries became the common treatment um, currently in the medical institution for children. Um, and then also it's gonna be uh, more broadly about the intersex justice movement and uh, what happened at Lurie and what's happening in California right now with the, with the new bill. So um, yeah, we had some momentum right before COVID and we're hoping to shoot it last year, but hopefully now we'll, we'll get to it at some point this year. Excellent, excellent. I'm excited for, for you all. Um, why don't we turn to some questions raised by our audiences? Um, one of the attendee has a question for Peyton. Uh, if you had to recommend a few key resources other than your own film for people unfamiliar with the experiences of intersex people, what would you suggest? This could be books, films, uh, or social media accounts. Um, I would say the first movie you should watch other than the one you saw is um, called Intersections and it's uh, spelled differently than intersectionality, but it's got an X instead of a, you guys could get it, right? Intersection with an X. And it's in, it's on Amazon Prime, I wanna say, it used to be. And someone told me it's on Netflix, I think. And it's also, I know on YouTube, or at least it was for free. So check that film out. It's amazing. It's a really OG documentary, like 10 years old. Oh, someone put the link, Shauna did, thank you. Um, and it has, intersex people from all over the globe interviewed and it has a really deep dive into the history and beautiful wonder I was like 18 when I was filmed in it so you get to see me with really bad well interesting fashions at that time and you meet my snake and my neighbor's Rottweiler but um it's a great resource and then books I would say start with this book called Hermaphrodites and the Medical Invention of Sex by Alice Drager really great historical overview of how we got to the point of where we are today with intersex uh, surgeries in the 50s, 1950s, and then going forward. Wonderful book, amazingly like historical, um, the, the historical archives that were brought to light, the archival materials that are brought to light in that book are really amazing. 
Shona, you could probably recommend some things in, in um, River and Aubrey. And I would say also my Instagram account, um, I just decided today that I'm gonna start a new series of short videos called hashtag intersex joy, where I'm just gonna feature like positive, awesome things about intersex and also like facts and things, but also like including people to follow, films to watch, books to read and all that type of thing. So follow me on Instagram, I'm Pigeon, P-I-D-G-E-O-N. Um, and I will be sharing some resources moving forward and fun little things, but um, River, what do you think? And Aubrey, what do you think? And Shauna? For resources for resources uh i mean interact for sure gotta always shout them out i mean the intersex justice project oh well. yeah <laughs> <laughs> you look good instagram <laughs> and website great. and a new website intersex justice project and inter interact act dot or interact advocates dot org and it's also interact advocates on instagram and twitter yeah, I think there's a dash somewhere there. I'll put it in the comments or I'll put it in the, the chat. Thank you. Um, there's um, one question for Aubrey. Uh, can you talk about the experience of moving from a big name, big budget production like Transparent to running the shows on a smaller scale documentary? Um, sure. Uh, <laughs> So for me, there's, <laughs> um, I, I come from a more scrappy documentary background. So I definitely don't come from a background of transparent being like the norm of level of production that I'm used to. Although I do work on a lot of big budget shows and movies as well. Um, so really this, this project being a small scrappy low budget documentary is sort of like my wheelhouse. <laughs> um, whereas Transparent and those kinds of productions were more of a learning curve. Um, but, you know, any any project that I get to work on with queer people, intersex people, activists, that's always very thrilling to me. Thank you. Uh, there's also a question about uh, film industry. So. Uh, someone asks, it's easier to go along with the status quo in Hollywood, TV and film. Uh, have there been times when you all considered taking the easy way? Or can you talk about times when you felt more encouraged to tell stories that challenge the gender binary? I think this is direct to uh, all of you. So someone feel free to take this on. I mean, I feel like it's currently happening. The, the hard road is currently, I feel like being walked on right now. I mean, I, I mean, I don't, I have so many conversations with my managers where they, you know, tell me about what, what they think would be marketable for, for me to write. And I just, I always say like, if my, if my heart's not in it, if there aren't, you know, if it's not about like queer and non-binary and trans people, like I don't want to do something that's not about that. Like, and, and yeah, and I, I just have, I just have the faith and I just know that like in the next few years, there's going to be, and it's already happening. Like there's just, there's just gonna be more explosions of queer people and intersex people and trans people and non-binary people on screen. And I just, despite, you know, that needle being, as slow as it's moving or just at the rate that it's moving or I wish that it would just, you know, just, it would just pop off. Like, you know, it's gonna happen. And um, because I, I was just watching yesterday um, this show Veneno on HBO Max and it's about a trans, uh, a trans person in high school who like tracks down this like famous uh, like Spanish uh, tra uh, like trans person like that they used to watch like on TV and stuff. Um, it takes place in Spain. And it was just like, I was crying last night and I was just like, wow, it is just so, that feeling of like, you know, literally seeing your experience on television, it just, it's electrifying. And that's just gonna happen more and more. And 
I think the consciousness is also being raised to the extent that like non-queer people and non-trans people like cis people or like hetero you know if that still exists like those people are also being inspired by and and you know potentially looking at their own gender and their own sexualities and starting their own journeys and so I think like yeah I mean it's I think it's funny what Pigeon said about you know are there any heterosexual people anymore but I think it's going to be true I think in the future there's they're not going to everyone's just going to be you know fluid and you know just interested in being their own individual selves, whatever that may mean to them. And that's the agenda that I want to push in all the stories and TV and movies that uh, I want to do. Before we closing, uh, Aubrey, Pachin, uh, do you have something that you would like to add? Um, just agreeing with River that like, we are still facing a major learning curve for people to even know the basics of what intersex is. I've pitched our longer form documentary to so many people in Hollywood and even people who sh I would think should know better who are on the LGBTQIA plus spectrum, who I say intersex and get through half the pitch and they're like, wait, hold on, intersex is trans, right? I like, and that was something that we were up against with, you know, a normal girl too, is that we couldn't just make a film that didn't have a lesson of what this is because so few people right now understand. And I think that now that people have a, more of a baseline understanding of what trans is, I think we're getting to the point that intersex is starting to, you know, sort of seep into the popular culture or something like that. But um, we're definitely not there yet. And so we just need to keep making content <laughs> and putting intersex people, you know, who want to be out there, out there so that people can start to understand. And then we don't have to only tell a story about what intersex is when we see an intersex person on screen. I think that's the biggest point that Aubrey brings up is that intersex people are not in the popular culture at all just at all right now like it's not in the popular consciousness where you were if you were to go anywhere you know and if you were to ask what does intersex mean most people would not be able to tell you most queer people also would not be able to tell you I don't want to say about most but I would I would say you'd be disappointed about how many queer people wouldn't be able to give you an answer and we've come to the point where people trans being trans is part of the popular culture. Like someone could tell you the definition of trans and it's knowing a word and then putting a face and an identity to those words, putting a face and identity and a story that touches you on a, on a human level to those words. Those are like all layers that we need to get to immediately. Uh, otherwise, you know, all this legislation won't change until those layers are you know broken through thank you yeah i would say Jen. like something that scares me is the intermingling i see between the people on the right the extremists right right wing extremists and also just general people on the right and their conflation of this country, like the things they that they see as negative about anything liberal or on the left is they're also, they're not only focusing on like monetary policy anymore or immigration policy. They also really focus on like, well, also abortion is one of their big things. But lately I've been seeing so much um, anti-trans, like trans hatred and also intersex, like pushback against trans and intersex non-binary, anything gender neutral. Um, it seems to really rile up these like QAnon people and ex other extremists just as much as like their fear of socialism is they also have this fear that there's this group of people who are trying to make every kid trans and intersex like which. So that is something I think needs to get talked about more. And um, we have to, do something as a community, as a country, as a government, at, in all the layers and levels, and as creatives and as artists and allies to address this simmering. I mean, trans women are killed, trans women of color especially, 
are killed all the time just for existing in their skin. Um, and so there's this simmering like hatred and, and, and then there's murders. It's not just simmering of anything deemed as not in the binary. And intersex to me is definitely an example of existing outside of the sex binary. And um, I think it's getting, you know, it just needs to, we really need to address this maybe in, I've always thought in preschool, just start teaching the kids what intersex is and what trans is. So in 10, 20 years, we have a generation of people that at least have the baseline, like every grade, you know, talk about intersex, talk about trans, talk about LGBTQ and, um, yeah and 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 you know our films are part of that that culture shift and i'm proud of that but we yeah. as we can tell we can see we need a lot more um education going on yeah. and to, mm -hmm. to follow up on that patient Aubrey and reaper so if if financing wasn't a problem uh what sort of stories that you would like to tell to put it out there Did you say this was for Aubrey or what did you say? Uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's to all of you, but oh, all of us. Okay, gotcha. Over the I weekend. guess. Oh, go ahead. Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, no. <laughs> Just no. unbridledly queer stories. I mean, we're always having to put these stories into some kind of box or package that makes them understandable to people who are not a part of our community. And if money was no object, we wouldn't have to make movies for those people. We could just make movies for our people and hopefully everybody else will like them too, or most people. What about you, River? I, over the weekend was thinking about like, I had this idea for like, I started listening to like Aztec and Mayan drumming and like shamanic music and I was thinking like whoa it would be so amazing if there was like you know just like a queer non-binary indigenous like epic like Star Wars but like with queer people in it and like with like you know just like heroic like the movies that they that Hollywood finds it easy to spend like millions and millions of dollars on like what if that budget was given and that kind of like, you know, heroic epic was given to an intersex or trans narrative, like, and that was like, um, it, but it, right now it won't happen because people, they wouldn't risk giving that money for such a small group who would want to see the movie. Um, but if it was, you know, if suddenly there was a consciousness that, everyone just liked stories in general, no matter what identities they were in, like you could make that happen. So yeah, epic hero movie. That's not even the kind of movies that I really like. I like small, weird, like indie dramas, but I'm like, I would, that would just be incredible. Like if, you know, there would just be just, just epic big movies with intersex, trans, non-binary, people of color. Yeah. Yeah, I um, honestly, if money was no issue, I would create a fund for intersex and trans uh, directors and art and actors and story screenwriters and documentary filmmakers. And it would have billions of dollars in it. And then everyone in this world who wanted to make their film or is working on a film already needs to get it funded, would just have access to it. And then I think that would be amazing because I don't know like which story would be great to tell. There's so many and I do love documentaries. Documentaries like make me like have changed so much of me throughout my life. Like, so that's why I was like drawn to this too because I love documentaries, but also I love, now I'm liking like the type that River was talking about. Like I like magical stuff too. Like I'm watching His Dark Materials, which is in a universe like ours, but it's, and it's a parallel universe. And I love those, like those stories where you can get into like animals talking and magic and this and that. And so I'm torn between like a documentary, but also like something like River was saying, like something super magical and beautiful and amazing. Cause that's what trans and intersex people ultimately are. Is we are super amazing, beautiful and magical. And we bring 
Um, I often say this country would be nothing without immigrants, like literally trash. This country would be trash. It would be like in a dumpster burning itself all the time with just like without immigrants. And I feel the same way about gender, like with like cis people would just be trash without the way that they po uh, pull the best parts of queer culture, trans culture, intersex culture. I don't even know if there is intersex culture, but trans and non-binary and queer culture, right? So like, why don't we get, why don't we get to make films like that? Like we always, like Rivers film, that's why I love Rivers film because it's the first intersex film that isn't necessarily all about intersex trauma and surgeries and pain and this and that. It's about a love, it's a love story and it's magical. And, um, you know, one of my favorite intersex films, I forgot to mention this, is called XXY, I think. And it was made, it was filmed in Argentina, but I think it was like Uruguayan film or something. Um, beautiful, amazing film. And <clears throat> some people probably disagree with me. They say it's sensational. I don't care. And like River, I was bawling. I was bawling watching the story. And there's this one scene where the intersex child like a cis dude and it's like I've never seen that on tv and she's she's a girl that the parents might want to do surgery on but there's a scene on film in xxy I think it's called um where she's on top of a boy and she's you know I don't know their pronouns and I'm just like we need more like that like because that's that's what we need and and I want to see sorry I want to see what's it called scary movies I want to see one of those scary movies where an intersex person takes revenge on their surgeons and like cuts them up in really like tough ways like and that's, that's a thriller we need a psychological thriller like parasite or something but with intersex people who reclaim their power against the surgeons that would be lit too thank you thank you everyone Bye, thank everyone. you all so much thank you everyone this has been great